let's get to the next story because this one's really interesting as well. In reference to this conflict between Russia and Ukraine, you know, we've talked about how some of the European countries have been affected in reference to the inflation because of the Nord Stream pipeline. So we talked about the UK, we've talked about Germany, we've talked about France as well. People are still protesting in France. But now we're going to talk about how this war is actually hurting countries in Africa, even though Africa didn't even take a side. So you have to remember that they decided to remain neutral in reference to this conflict with Russia and Ukraine. But just because they decided to remain neutral doesn't mean that they're not hurting. I want to go to this clip here. I think this is really important for people to see, and then we'll get into a couple other specifics as well. Can the war in Ukraine cause a famine in Africa? Everyone needs to hear this. Landmass. But the reality, visual politic viewers, is that the war has turned the world upside down. We've already told you in a lot of videos how it has caused chaos in the energy markets. However, that's not the only consequence. The war in Ukraine is also putting another very important market, the agricultural market, on the ropes. Think about it. It is very difficult to live without oil, without gas, or with the price of these hydrocarbons skyrocketing. But living without wheat or corn is not easy either. In fact, for millions and millions of people, the lack of these foods could mean the difference between eating or going hungry. And you'll probably say, okay, yeah. but what do Russia and Ukraine have to do with all of this? Well, more than you might think. Basically because we are talking about two of the largest agricultural producers in the world. I'm sure many of you who are watching us from Europe, from the United States, or even from Latin America have noticed that food prices have gone up a lot during the last year. Well, you already know what one of the main reasons is. It certainly has been tough, but fortunately, in general, in most parts of the world, we are not starving. However, there is one part of the world where the same cannot be said, Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> We have told you many times here on Visual Politic how in the world, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, so much progress has been made in recent years that, for many people, famines were doomed to be nothing more than bad chapters in the history books. And in so they were actually at the point in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa where they would not even have to revisit famine again. They had gotten past that point. But then there was a war. Indeed, famine did seem to be on the road to extinction. The Russian and Ukrainian agricultural sectors have been key players in this. To give you an idea, Ukraine produces enough food for 400 million people every year, many of them in sub-Saharan Africa. But now the war has complicated everything. Grain exports from Ukraine and Russia are no longer as large and frequent as they were before Putin launched his troops on his neighboring country. And naturally, this has caused tensions in agricultural markets to skyrocket. And so he's talking about grain, he's talking about wheat. Remember uh, a while back, I told you about the food shortage that was in North Korea. They were also impacted by the war between Russia and Ukraine because they actually depended on fertilizer from Russia. So that affected them again, like even countries that may not be involved, maybe did not take a side in reference to this conflict at all. That still doesn't mean they're not affected because they were depending on, you know, products from Russia in particular or Ukraine in order to feed their people. Not just because Ukrainian Black Sea ports are constantly targeted by Russia or because fighting has limited Ukraine's production, but because even sanctions on Russia now make its exports much more difficult and more expensive. The result? The likelihood of an uncontrolled food crisis has not been this high since the 1980s. So the question is, what initiatives are being promoted to avoid a catastrophic famine? Why were Russia and Ukraine selling so much wheat to Africa? And two other questions that may surprise you even more. What is Turkey's role of all of this in the story? Could Turkey succeed in preventing a worldwide famine? Today we're going to answer all of these questions, but first, you know what's coming. Let's look at some history. We're just going to fast forward a little bit here because uh, he goes through some stuff that we've already talked about. It's the history, yada, 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 yada. This part right here, agriculture, I want you to see. Proportion of people working in agriculture increasing. However, wait a moment, because not all of the process was quite so successful. Sub-Saharan Africa was the only region of the world that could not successfully join the Green Revolution. Why? 
Well, actually, for several reasons. The first, and perhaps most important, is that while the rest of the countries were already independent during the Green Revolution, many of the sub-Saharan African countries were still struggling to free themselves. And when they succeeded, internal power struggles and corrupt governments began to flourish, making it virtually impossible to develop infrastructure projects that would allow production to be increased and then transported from one place to another. Of course, investment in agricultural development needs sufficient infrastructure to be able to quickly export their production. That's not all though. For example, this same lack of infrastructure is also one of the reasons why fertilizer use is so low in the region, because transportation costs are much higher. And if we which means they would have to have fertilizer brought in. They would have to have the exports for the so see that's that's the thing. If you're depending on one of these countries for fertilizer, like Russia or Ukraine, and right now, because there is this conflict and the sanctions that were put on Russia by the US government, like I told you a while back, that wasn't just going to impact Russia, that was also going to hurt other countries as well that depend on those products from Russia in order to grow food. And here we are. Add to all this the extreme climatic conditions in many areas of sub-Saharan Africa, then we have the perfect cocktail to explain the underdevelopment of the sector in the region. This is precisely what explains, to a large extent, why subsistence agriculture is still the order of the day here, and why many of the countries in the region have to import so much food. And as the population keeps growing, then the problem is clear. The demand for food imports is increasing. And of course, faced yep. with such a scenario, the Ukrainian war has set that ticking time bomb off. Visual politic viewers, this is precisely the number one reason why the Ukrainian war has become such a huge nightmare for the forgotten continent. Check. Notice that he refers to Africa as the forgotten continent. It's pretty sad if you think about it. I don't think it should be forgotten, but for some reason it tends to escape people's to escape people's minds. Uh, but it's 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 very important. And we're gonna get into something else here. As, as well in reference to Africa with this war between Russia and Ukraine about what he just said there about it being the forgotten continent. So hold on to that thought because we're going to get into that a little bit later. Check this out. The music, he's got to do something with that. Famine. Yeah, I don't like your... I, the music is killing me, but the other part I wanted to get to was this piece right about... It's towards the end. Here. Where he talks about the corn prices. Yeah. Wheat and corn prices have been falling since the initiative was signed. However, there have been moments of great uncertainty because at times Russia has given the impression that it wants to break this agreement. This has caused prices to rebound every now and then. And the fact is that Moscow is playing with this initiative. They are trying to use it to get some sanctions eased. For example, when Putin signed his participation in July 2022, he did so for four months. And in November, when he renewed it, he did the same. But just recently, on the 18th of March this year, when he had to renew it, he did so for only 60 days. Why? Because he wants to tighten the screws on Western countries. And not only that, Russia wants to exploit this position intensively. Just look at this. If we finally... I don't even know if I would say exploit the position, but this is a, a speech here. I'll get into it in just a second. If you are that country and you have sanctions put on you, why would you not try to find a way to get those sanctions eased, right? But listen to what he says here. Listen to this. If we finally decide not to extend the agreement within 60 days, we are ready to supply from Russia free of charge to these countries all the volume sent during the last time to the African countries in special need. Now, this is March of this year. Decide not to extend this agreement within 60 days. We are ready to supply from Russia free of charge to these countries all the volume sent during the last time to the African countries in special need. V. Putin. March 2023. We can't be sure that this is going to be the case until Russia decides to withdraw from the initiative, if it does pull out. But giving something away for free, I don't know, that doesn't seem very Russian to me. They always want something in return. So, yeah, so and we're going to stop it here because, of course, I think you guys understand what he's trying to get into there. Um, but he's also he's basically trying to make it seem like, oh, no, they're, they're, they would definitely never do that. We don't know. We don't know until it happens. But the point that he made there about Africa actually hurting because of this war, Russia and Ukraine is, is spot on. Yes, there are food issues and it really sucks because. They did not take a side in reference to this conflict, and they're still being impacted, even when they were being bullied to take a side. Now, 
I want to show you a clip in reference to this as well. Let me pull this up here. It says, if, if Africans have learned anything from the removal of Russia from the SWIFT community, then it ought to be evident that, one, our banks need to transact without any foreign intermediaries, and two, trade in Africa should not rely on foreign currencies. This is especially crucial right now during the conflict with Russia and Ukraine, because as you see this issue with famine, if it were to the point where African countries would not have to depend on these allies or other countries in order to feed their people or in order to take care of their people, then they can break, break away from that and break that chain. But as it stands right now, they were depending on fertilizer and other products from Russia. And now they're having difficulty getting it. So what he is encouraging African people to do right now is that they need to find a way to fully break away from that foreign dependence, to not depend on those other countries and to be able to have those things their self. Listen to what he says. Look at the entire banking sector and the entire banking ecosystem. He's talking about the banking sector. If you want to move money, it is swift think SWIFT is incorporated in Switzerland. Little Switzerland. If I want to move money from South Africa to Nairobi, the Federal Bank of South Africa will ask many questions and then I'll provide a SWIFT number. Then the intermediary bank will be in New York, not in Mozambique, in New York. If it is going to Europe, it is IBAN. We are not in control. He said, we are not in control. And they're not. Let me let him finish here. I listened to the panel. And I respect all of them. They are talking about clouds. Who's clouds? <laughs> Who's clouds? They are talking about digitization. Who's digitization? Not theirs. This is important, guys. Not theirs. They are talking about cryptocurrency. Who's cryptocurrency? There you go. You can be switched off in the twinkling of an eye and you are back in the dark ages. That is the reality. There's a saying in my mother tongue. When you are milking a borrowed cow, you must always look towards the gate because the owner may come at any time. <laughs> and I'm saying that Africa is milking borrowed cows. It is milking borrowed cows and we must be on the lookout. Very, very important for people to hear. Now, there's an article here I want to I want to mention as well. This also goes along with this in reference to this conflict with Russia and Ukraine. And I want people to fully understand what he's trying to say here. This idea of African countries still having to depend on other foreign countries in order just to function or get things done, whether it's the food products that are coming in, et cetera. They need to break away from that is what he's saying. They are usually, as the gentleman said in the other video, the forgotten continent. They're usually at the bottom. And I wanna show you this article, which says just that, listen to this. It says practical pan-Africanism secures Africa's dignity. Let me go into this here. I'm gonna make this bigger because the font is tiny. Okay, that's better. <clears throat> Boop. It is an incontestable fact that the world is undergoing major geostrategic shifts. One of the interesting aspects of these shifts has been the anxiety that is faced by the major global players, which validates the saying that when the big neighbor sneezes, everyone is likely to catch a cold. 
Africa's predisposition has been to stay as far away as possible, lest it catches a cold. However, there is only so much that this approach can achieve. In this competition of geo strategy, the world is being redefined, which means that Africa itself is being redefined. In other words, it is radically significant process to which Africa cannot afford to stay indifferent. Europe, and to a lesser extent, America, anxiety has a lot to do with reordering of the world. It is a world in which the West is used to being on top of the food chain. And from the higher rung, it lectures others on what the rules and values are or should be and how to play them. This goes back to what the gentleman just said in the video. We are not in control. When he mentioned the digital currency, the cryptocurrency, he said, who's cryptocurrency? Who's digital currency? They don't own it. Let's go on here. Therefore, it is not surprising that in the process of redefining the world, the rules and values that govern it, Europe has been very aggressive. It is as if it fears that it could become the next Africa and finds itself at the bottom of the food chain. Why is this a problem for Europe? Well, Europe understands that it has had an overwhelming influence in defining the image of Africa, especially over the past half century. It knows full well the role it has played in misrepresenting Africans as a hopeless people without agency, a people whose life chances, whoopsie, are left to Western benevolence. This was evident in media coverage of the pandemic as Europe battled with one of its worst health crises in decades. Even as the death toll worsened in its own backyard, Europe seemed to be preoccupied with the mystery of why aren't Africans dying? It is incomprehensible that Africans could perform better than Europeans in containing the effects of the pandemic. All kinds of analysis, including the advantage of poverty, a headline the BBC was forced to retract, were used to explain Africans' reluctance to conform to the image Europe had shaped for them and conform Europe's predictions of high death rates in Africa. Now, this is the key right here. Meanwhile, while African institutions had money, they could not find, we'll say medicines here, to buy because Western governments had hoarded them beyond what they needed for their people. Again, the Western media narrative had to weaponize benevolence by showcasing the donation of jabs that were near expiration or those that had already expired. Now we get into the point here about Ukraine. So in the present context of the war in Ukraine, an ensuing food and energy crisis, Europe understands that its vulnerability invites others to define it just as it has done for Africa. Similarly, it understands that the ability to define others is a weapon to strip them of their dignity. It is therefore not surprising that Europe is the most nervous in the ongoing process to reshape the world as it fights to prevent itself from being, from becoming another Africa. This part right here, let's highlight this. It is therefore not surprising that Europe is the most nervous in the ongoing process to reshape the world as it fights to prevent itself from becoming another Africa. Those who are nervous are susceptible to becoming aggressive. So has Europe. Times are changing. We have BRICS. We have countries that have come together that have decided not to 
pursue the U.S. dollar anymore and to have their own currency. The power dynamic in the world is starting to shift to the point where a powerful country like the U.S. is starting to lose some of its power. And some of these other countries are starting to work on their own. Now it goes on to say, this time again, Western coverage of the war in Ukraine is repeatedly predicting the worst for Africa, not Europe, where the war, where the war is taking place. War is in Europe, but the victims are in Africa. I'm going to say this again one more time. War is in Europe, but the victims are in Africa. And this goes right back to the video, the first video that you saw in reference to this particular discussion, where they talk about the famine where they talk about the food supply. They're not even involved, but they seem to be hit some of the hardest. The images of the, cata the catastrophic consequences of the war are the starving and hungry Africans, despite the greater effects of the war on Europe. Famine fearing Africans dominate Western media coverage. This is so sad. This is crazy. This is so sad. Listen to this. In the media's war opposing the West and Russia around the food crisis in Europe, Europeans claimed that Putin was not allowing food to leave Ukraine, while Putin claimed that sanctions and mine passages were the reason the food remained in storage. So we got to go back to what we talked about earlier, the sanctions that the U.S. government implemented on Russia. That prevents them from doing the trade. And that in turn will affect people in countries in Africa. It always seems to go right back to the U S. So Africa's top leader, Maki Saul and Musa Faki were mobilized to pressure Putin, who according to the Western media narrative was threatening Africans with hunger. You see how this works. Russia was starving Africa. Saul apparently told Putin that Africa was at the mercy of the war in Ukraine, in other words, at Putin's mercy. While in fact, Europeans wanted to beg Putin for food, they couldn't imagine sacrificing their dignity in the process. How could self-respecting people line up to beg Putin for food? They must have asked themselves. So you see what they're saying here? The media is making it seem like that Russia is purposely starving people in countries in Africa and leaving out the fact that the food, those products can't move because of the sanctions. So I wanted to talk about this today because I feel like we've talked a lot about the war between Russia and Ukraine, and we've talked about its effects on European countries, but we also need to cover how it's affecting countries in Africa. And again, you can point your fingers back in a circle and it comes right back around to the United States because if it wasn't for the, those sanctions, they would still be able to move those products to countries in Africa. So yet people in Africa, once again, could be seeing another famine. Crazy times we're living in, guys. This is why you have to push back against the mainstream media narrative because they'll leave that piece out. But what people are complaining about in Africa is that it may be time that they cut their dependence on other foreign countries. And I'm here for it. Dwayne says on the West, not other countries, the West and the U S wants to keep Africa dependent and exploited. Thank you for the super chat. CC good work and good reporting. You put reporting the truth before your own opinion. And I so respect that savvy. Thank you so much. P says Gaddafi was going to mint his own money and unite Africa eventually with their own currency. Look what Hillary did to prevent that. Hard Lens, what's up, Kit? I encourage you all when you have time to check out Fall of Civilization podcast, All Empires Fall. That's right. And shout out to Indy Left, says, hi, Sabby. What's up, Indy? I'll take that comment on there. There you go. Shout out to Roger Meadows for being a Sabby member for one month. So they got their own version of the Homestead Act, huh? <laughs> 
Here you go. There you go.